everybody, this is Birch. Um, I've talked before, and when we used to do live streams, and one day we'll, one day we'll probably do them again. Um, I'd like to get, I don't know, I'm torn. On, on one hand, I'd like to get back to them and, and do them. On the other hand, there's this weird effect going on where I get these uh, threatening males that talk about, uh, you know, hey, you're never going to be popular. You're never going to do anything unless you do live streams again. Or, um, you know, hey, I subscribe to your show. I demand a live stream. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a weird, I don't know, there's an element out there that gets really pissy about that kind of stuff. And uh, the, the other one that I really enjoy, it's like, have you seen that Wes's show now gets a bunch of you? Like he gets over 200 viewers on a live stream. That's more than you got. I'm like, yeah, you know, what do you have to say about that? And I'm like, congratulations, Wes. I, what, what, are, what, am, what are you supposed to say to that? Good, good, good. I'm glad it's, I'm, Wes works really hard. I'm glad it's working out for him. I like, what, what am I supposed to be like? Ah, damn it. I've got to work really hard to get to 200 viewers myself. That, that's insane thinking. No, I'm mean, good for, good for him. I, I'm, what, what do you want? <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the live stream, there, there is a, a strange kind of, I, I, I don't know, the, the live stream group is uh, causing me some angst. And what's sad about it, by the way, is that 95% of the people who enjoy the live stream, I've heard from uh, some creator, I, I think I could say, like Joe Casey reached out and it's like, I miss the live streams. And that's nice. I, that, that, no, no problem with that. That's just being nice. Um, 95% of the people are nice, but then there's this 5% of lunatics that are like, you better do this. You better do this or I'll take your show down. <laughs> what? I, I mean, I'm bored, but to take the show down, let's see what you can do. <laughs> I'm curious what that looks like. Anyway, I, uh, people are nuts. Anyway, here, uh, in the live streams, we used to talk a lot about the amount of comics being published. One of my favorite moments was getting Joe to, uh, you know, groan and uh, sob with uh, with with sadness when we would put up the uh, hey, there's 480 titles coming out this month. <laughs> just the, the expression of of sheer just crushing disappointment always lifted my soul a little bit. Uh, but there's there's a lot of titles. Uh, Marvel and DC still chur you know churning out somewhere in the 80 title a month range. It's a lot. And uh, what I think is very clear at this point, and I, I was saying for a while, but I think it's, it's, it's indisputable and obvious now, is that the publishers don't have the capability to market or promote or manage that many books. They, they simply don't. So what happens is they kind of sort of focus on 10 to 15 of them. And then the others are just, they fend for themselves. And I, I mean, I, that doesn't seem like a good plan, but that's, that's kind of where we are. So anyway, here's a, here's a viewer who's writing in with a perspective on this, and it says, uh, so here's an idea I'd love to hear your perspective on. Say Marvel just went for a title-wide time jump with all new number ones. That's kind of what they did after Secret Wars. But in the process, cut their total titles in half. So they had just 20 ongoing titles and 10 miniseries. That would be in a third, sir. Not including separate IP properties like Alien and Star Wars that are unchanged. Okay, well, all right. So it's not a reboot, but kind of a reset. And they could slogan it like quality over quantity or something like that. The 20 ongoings are mostly classic selling characters and teams like Spider-Man, Wolverine, Fantastic Four, X-Men, etc. Maybe a couple titles to promote characters they really want to grow in popularity like Miles Morales. And after this, they don't relaunch any of the titles for at least five years to see how things go. Meanwhile, the 10 miniseries promote nine smaller characters and teams like She-Hulk or X-Factor, as well as one event title. They have a fall and a spring season. Of the 10 titles in the fall season, they can look at the reception and sales halfway through. And if the titles are doing uh, really well, they can give the okay for a season two next fall. Same creative team if possible. So the best miniseries keep going, making customers more invested. I think this would be a great way to get things more organized, potentially allow for better continuity management, but the problem is, would total revenue just plummet with less titles, or would the hype of a fresh start and a more organized approach be enough to offset that? I don't know, but I'd love your comic and business insights on the matter. All right. So um, if they did this, here's how it would play out. So what would, what would immediately happen is they would have a big revenue drop. 
So that right now, the qu the quantity of their titles is you know putting them at a certain bellwether of, of sales. So you have um, a bunch of sale, you've got a bunch of titles kind of averaging out at about thirty five to forty thousand uh, total sale total units that are being moved, and those are clocking in at three ninety nine four ninety nine. And that's become the, the benchmark that Marvel is measured against. And what they found is that launching a new book, even with a killer creative team, even on a you know, highly established IP, if they do not do variant covers, if they don't do a bunch of hype for a number one issue, then it launches typically in the 50 to 60,000 range, you know, kind of at best. If they do all the gimmicks with the variants and everything else and can get that thing up, you know, to 80 to 100, or if they do a real mega launch like a Spider-Man, they can get that thing up over 150, 200. I mean, at that point, they start doing uh, interesting promotions and incentive programs, and it goes, you know, into the, into the orbit. But the problem is they can't keep that audience, and that's been pretty proven. Uh, the titles then you know, over the course of about six issues, drop back down to about 45,000, and that's where it sits, even if it has a huge launch. And the smaller titles, the ones that are intended to be experimental, grab an audience and grow them, they tend to hover around 25,000 or so. Now, one of the challenges we have when looking at the numbers is that the numbers right now are estimates. We don't get the precise numbers or mostly precise numbers. You, you, you be, we were about 95% precision. Now we're about 15% precision. And, uh, the, you know, the numbers that you're seeing, most likely from a Comicron, uh, the, you know, the guy's using a formula to try and get to what the numbers are. They're, they're basically taking a pretty small sampling size from Comics Hub. They're then using, you know, some, some basic math to say, you know, well, the titles, uh, you know, based on, on past history, because we know what we know what Comic Hub stores were selling when we had precise numbers. Now we don't have precise numbers, but we can do an equation that basically will net us out what we think it's it's about. And th there's nothing wrong with that. I like the uh, I like the data. Um, however, I think it's highly likely that things in the comic industry have changed, and so I don't know that that equation, that math, still works the same way. And I know that uh, there's a lot of retailers, in particular that have started to take real, you know, issue with ICV2 and Comic Sub or, and, uh, and Comic Ron in general, because they believe that the, the numbers are gamed way, way beyond where, you know, they're, they are, where they're, they're likely. And, and that's, again, that's not, that's not the people who run those sites fault. They're, they're giving us data and they're not hiding the fact that they're doing this, this equation. They're not, they're not like pretending you know, they're, they're saying, hey, we're, we're doing estimates and here's how we do it. And I, I respect that, completely respect it. Um, but, but all the same, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to believe some of those numbers are accurate. It, again, and I'm not saying that as like, oh, no, I'm positive the comic industry is failing. And so any good news must be wrong. I'm not saying it for that perspective. I'm saying it more from if you take a, a pivot and you look at the retailers some of the titles that, that are being announced there are, are not selling in stores. And enough retailers have put together a network to say, hey, we'll move the comics around if, if you know, I just have the weird store that's not selling stuff, but you're selling stuff, and I have overage, then, you know, let's, let's work out a deal. There's enough of that system that's been established, but, it's, but that, that's not happening. The comics aren't moving. So, you know, be that as it may. So, I mean, but, but going back to kind of your mail and your idea, uh, th what you would see if they cut titles is that the, the market, the customer base and the stores are all, you know, predisposed and geared toward this current model, the model of kind of pump and dump, you know, put out uh, big variant covers, uh, incentive programs, everything else, get the titles up. And then promptly the sales plummet, but then you ride the wave to the next number one, and you constantly relaunch and everything else. So you'd see, you would see sales fall. And even if you went out with a well, just an absolutely stellar marketing campaign to say, nope, we're doing things very differently, as you say, quality over quantity. Unfortunately, the you know business like this it doesn't move suddenly, it doesn't change course suddenly. So you would see retailers and you would see customers still behaving like they are today which is geared toward the current model. 
So what would have to happen is that the publishers would have to basically say, okay, we're going to wait this out two years because it would take a minimum of two years for the market to pivot. We're going to wait it out and we're going to lose money for two years. We're going to go ahead and hurt our revenue, but we're going to commit to the bit because we believe that two years of resetting the market is healthy for comics and healthy for buyers and we're backed by, you know, Marvel and or, you know, Disney and, and Discovery and all the rest. And they're not looking at our books anyway. So, you know, we're not we're not really losing money. I mean, I don't know, in, in some of the staff overages that Marvel has, maybe you start to lose money. I, I don't I don't know. But at any rate, we're gonna make less money for about two years. But in the process, we're going to reset the buying habits. We're gonna change this thing to a healthier, more sustainable model. And we're going to do so in a way that's going to make it easy for us to distribute other places. Because the reality is, if you're running with 10 to 20 titles, or let's say 20, uh, you're far more likely to get that distribution deal with a Target or a Walmart or a, a big box store. Um, you have a better chance of uh, really honing in on a subscription model with an Amazon or somebody who could you know, deliver comics. I mean, I mean the reality is, you can't, uh, you know, work out a distribution deal with Amazon. And so Prime members could still get their comics on Wednesday with everybody else just delivered to their home. Yeah, I mean, you could do that. But it's hard to do that when you've got 80 plus titles and you're relaunching constantly and it's too much management to keep up with the line. So, you know, but I think I think you have to take that bullet at some point. And you have to say, yeah, okay, we're resetting the market. We're resetting our, our expectations for business. So we're going to have two hard years. You, I think that has to occur. And it would be a good time for that to occur right now when your parent companies are largely writing you off and not paying attention. It would be, it, now's the time. Uh, you know, go out with a business strategy. I, knowing Disney well enough, I have a feeling that Disney would welcome a plan. Meaning if, if you went out there and you said, hey, we're going to do this, and this is the impact, and this is our, you know, this is how we're going to increase distribution in the future, and this is how we're going to streamline the, the line, and this is how we're going to, you know, do better business. My feeling is that Disney, again, having engaged with them previously, would say, oh, thank God, somebody here is actually trying to run a business. Excellent. Okay, yeah, we, we, yeah, we understand. You know, report on the numbers, get some KPIs, key performance indicators, get get some uh, way to measure if you're moving along to the plan you think. But but yeah, absolutely. Well, you you can you could make less money for for two years. Yes, I mean if you are heading to a place where we can increase our distribution, increase our reach, and have more market presence with these books and have a more manageable line, yes, we're in. I I, I think you'd see support. So I, I would do it. Now, one consequence to this, if we're just being completely and bluntly honest, is that you would see it would provide an opening for Image and a lot of the indies to be able to come in and, and you know, basically get some more attention for comics because they wouldn't be flooded off the shelves. But, you know, I, I think it's worth taking that risk. And again, I think that'd be healthier for the comic industry. One last thing to mention on all this is unfortunately the retailers are also locked into the current model. So you've got to, you know, in the midst of doing all this, if you suddenly take away a bunch of titles, you're not taking away massive sales, but you are going to clip off, you know, I don't know, 10 to 20% of their monthly revenue doing this plan. And for some stores, that's their margin. That's how they're staying alive. So if you still care about the retailer as a channel, you're going to have to figure out a way to keep them whole in the process as well. And maybe it's as simple as just increase the margin. I mean, you know, one thing you could do in terms of a business strategy is to make these adjustments to the titles and say, you know, hey, go all in. Order If you order a minimum threshold, meaning you order at least 20 of each title or 50 of each title, whatever it happens to be, then your margin jumps to 65% or 70%. So you're going to get a bigger cut. And again, that would have a short-term business impact, a negative impact, to Marvel and DC. But it would create a healthier business model. It would create a more stable business model 
And I think within 18 to 24 months, they would recover that revenue and grow. And so I think it'd be good for them and be good for everybody. Honestly, it'd be good for the comic shops because they'd have, uh, they'd also have a, a kind of far more sustainable kind of way of managing and doing their business. But anyway, uh, thank you very much for the question. It's a good one. I like speculating on this stuff. I mean, put it this way, things have to change. That's kind of the headline here. Things have to adjust. And in doing so, it's likely going to be a little painful. But, you know, I don't know. Start taking your medicine now. It's not going to, it's not going to taste better three years from now. So might as well get going on it. Thanks for listening.